We're live. Oh, very nice. Okay. Welcome to the third meeting of the MSOE Historical Society. Uh, if you want to grab some tea or cookies, now is your chance before our distinguished guest begins speaking. This is kind of the me introducing things first. Um, just to get you caught up with the org, we have some new stuff. I guess I should have switched to this slide before I said that, but in the corner there, there's stickers and there's tea and cookies. Uh, we have a Facebook page now. I just made this uh, this weekend. Uh, at first, I was like, oh, I don't know if I really need to put the time into giving us a social media page. But uh, we come across so many pictures and things that it's nice to be able to just send those out. And uh, uh, with an uncertain future when I graduate with this club, at least everything will be documented on Facebook. <laughs> um, and uh, next meeting, so I think it's two weeks from now, on the 24th, I'm working with the marketing department to get different pieces of footage and images on Newman. Um, some of this stuff exists online in like super low quality. So I'm hoping to get uh, good quality transfers. Uh, but don't do any research on your own on this. Uh, you'll be very surprised with what I come up with for the next meeting. And uh, Dr. Durant here, I'll introduce our distinguished guest. He's a professor and program director in our EECS department and uh, graduated in 98 with a uh, EE and CE degree uh, and is highly distinguished on campus. Um, so. I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Durant. Uh, th yes. Thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me to, to your meeting. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, re relive some good old days of uh, early history of the web at MSOE. So um, I prepared some slides and some illustrations of uh, what, what things were like back then, but please um, feel free to ask questions uh, or, you know, uh, share your comments at any time. And hopefully I can get this untangled here. Okay. Uh, so thanks for the, the great introduction. Um, I do have a link to my website there if anyone wants to know more. Uh, and um, a little bit of uh, background on me and my connection to the early World Wide Web at MSOE. Um, so I started as a student in September of 93 at MSOE. Uh, shortly after that, uh, the MSOE library actually created the first website. So uh, great job for the library. Back then, uh, the original World Wide Web, and we'll show some examples of the early systems that were used before that, um, when the internet was new, but before the web existed, um, it was seen mainly as an information resource. Uh, it, it was a place to look up library catalogs, look in directories, and more and more things were coming online. The commercial applications, uh, this is around the time Amazon was just starting. Uh, not many people had heard about them yet. And the marketing applications, they were going to come pretty soon, but this was an information resource primarily in the beginning. Um, I, I started off in the summers, my first two summers as a student working for the MSOE alumni office, getting exposed to some of the history uh, and how we were using technology on campus. Uh, and then um, a big step in 96 was the students and staff could actually were allowed to create their own web pages. That was a big step forward, and we did a lot of uh, I and a few other people did a lot of educational seminars, how you create a web page back then. And I'll have some examples of this, but it was it was writing code, it was knowing the Unix command line, and, and so on. The tools have gotten a lot easier um, since then. Um, so then, uh, starting around 96, MSOE started becoming much more aware of the um, marketing and public relations view of the website. It, it, it was a way people were looking us up to learn about us. Um, and the, the website, the locus really moved from the library to the marketing department. And around that time, MSOE actually hired me as an employee. Before that, it was volunteering, you know, like a lot of you do in your student organizations, 
Um, but but then I moved over and I was actually working part time for MSOE on the website uh, until a couple months after I graduated in '98. So that's that's my background and connection. I, I have a few slides with some historical context, um, and please you know ask questions or point out uh, interesting facts at or at any time. Um, so the um, back in the '40s, Vannevar Bush. Uh, was started writing uh, uh, about the idea that he could see, okay, there was electronic storage of data. Um, the very early vacuum tube computers were in use. They, they had shown a lot of great promise during the Second World War in doing computations. And he was really seeing a feature where information would be interlinked. So uh, yeah. Before this, right, most things were serial. You read through a book, that was the traditional way. But the idea of text linking to each other, all the information available in one electronic system where it would link to each other, he started uh, discussing. 20 years later, Ted Nelson uh, coined the term hypertext. So the, the folks who were paying attention there, the technology wasn't quite there yet, but the idea that you would have pieces of text and information with links to each other on some sort of computer system was envisioned, even though for most people, uh, the, the technology was still decades away. Um, Apple released a technology in 1987 called HyperCard, which brought this to a computer you could own at home finally. Um, card stacks were, was hypertext um, that you would download on your local computer. Um, it was used a lot for documentation. People would enhance them and share information and pass them either back and forth at first, either on disks or there were pre-internet um, online systems, bulletin board systems that you would use the modem connecting your full computer to the phone line at very low speeds where you could upload and download files. But it was, it was terribly slow. Uh, so gra graphics use was very limited. The fact that you could have some basic graphics in HyperCard was uh, pretty exciting. So things started getting going much more in the 90s. Um, uh, in 1991, University of Minnesota came up with the Gopher system, which looked a little bit like the web. The idea was there would be documents on electronic server system, maybe located in the university library, and they would be interlinked with each other. There would be some basic search facilities. Maybe you could search the directory of people or the library catalog, and maybe you would connect to this from uh, across campus. And uh, it looked originally like this. It was all text-based. Uh, links would have numbers. You would use the arrow keys on your computer. Um, no graphics. If you wanted to do a graphic, it would be a file attachment, and you would download it and use another program to view it. That was how it worked in the beginning. Then several years later, uh, Netscape, one of the first uh, big browser, well, second, third, a major browser that was released, um, it could still talk to these gophers. So this is different from the web. This is pre-web, a simpler, older protocol. Uh, and it would, it, it would present it like this, but basically the same, showing you these folders and resources you could connect to. So pretty limited. Uh, in the beginning. Um, moving on, uh, where does MSOE come into the picture? Um, folks involved, I think it was mainly in the precursor to our IT department uh, in the early 90s. Uh, there, uh, in, you can see in 1991, MSOE received a $20,000 National Science Foundation grant, and the idea was to connect um, MSOE to a um, network within the state called WISCnet. I, I don't know a lot about this. This was perhaps connected to the internet, but it wasn't really the full on the internet yet in 1991. And this was used um, by some folks on campus who needed to collaborate, share documents, maybe submit proposals and intermediate results and so on for work they were doing. Um, and so you, that you would upload and share documents, but the networks, very few people access them. They weren't widely used by folks on campus yet. So a um, little later that year, um, MSOE registered a class B block, which, was, which is a uh, 
uh, you know, there's four bytes in a uh, internet version four protocol address, and what a class B block is means um, you own um, uh, all the addresses where the last two bytes vary. So that means you have about 256 squared. You have over 60,000 addresses, unique addresses on the internet. That was a big deal, maybe more than we would ever need. So if you notice, if you if you ever look at IP config on one of your computers and you look at the outside address, or usually when your laptop joins it, if it's not going through some sort of translation, you see all our addresses start with 155.92. That's MSOE's address on the version four protocol today, right? Of the version six, the longer addresses are starting to supplant that, but these version four addresses are still used. So MSOE was pretty early in there. Um, one of the last class B blocks that uh, were, uh, were, were able to um, be distributed easily. There were class C ones, which is about 255 addresses that you could get after that. And then they became, they were very hot properly. Um, the Mosaic browser, this was uh, a, a, hu a huge thing. It was released in the early 90s. It was available for Microsoft Windows in, in late 1993. That was really the first widely used browser that would, when you were viewing the early websites, show you the graphics on your screen at the same time. It wasn't you had you needed to have a separate program or download them. So all very, uh, all very basic. Um, so MS, oh, and then just around this time, since we're in late 1993, I pulled off my shelf my first um, academic catalog from when I was a freshman. So this is the 1993 catalog. And so these are some interesting facts related to how people used computers back then. Um, an MS only student, you weren't necessarily expected to own your own computer. A lot of us did especially people in electrical or computer engineering, but not everyone owned their own computer back then. But here were the recommendations. It was the Intel 386 or 486 processor was the, was the new one. You could see here we were dealing with um, megabytes of RAM, not gigabytes. So today we're about a factor of thousand, a thousand more. Um, there, there, the, the, uh, there was no inherent internet connection. You would probably, if you wanted to be online by an external modem device, connect it over this serial port with several cables, connected to a phone line, uh, and that was how you connected to online services. And people were maybe, the folks who were very advanced might just be starting to use some internet services, but they hadn't even really heard of the web until the uh, late 93, early 94, and I was someone who was, you know, pretty into that at the time. Here are a little information, and I, I'm glad to share the slides if you have somewhere you want to post them. Um, then in uh, the same time, we can see in the residence halls, there was uh, one of the great things about living in the residence halls is you could uh, connect very easily to the campus computing system, but these were pre-internet at the time. If you wanted to send email to a friend who went to Marquette, the email addresses looked very complicated. It was like their address, and then you put something after to say, export this outside the network to Marquette, and it would eventually go, yeah. So why does it specify um, board technical communications? Um, well, that uh, that was one of the program, and and so are they are. Uh, where are we here? Recommendations oh. for students not in architectural engineering or communication. I don't know. I wonder if they were using Macs then, because uh, Gene Carter, an alumnus uh, of MSOE, one of the early employees at Apple, he supported various generation of Mac labs. So I wonder if they were using math technologies, perhaps, in the technical communication program. I'm not, I'm not quite sure why these recommendations didn't apply to that program. Okay. Um, I actually, he's long retired now, but I know the faculty member who directed that program. And if I, and I see him a couple times a year, I may ask him, okay. uh, what, why, why was the recommendation? But I do know they were, they were, getting, they were really into Macintosh use back then. Um, okay, moving now into some, some 93, 94 history. Um, around the middle of 93, the precursor to the IT department, CCSD, Campus Computing Services Department is what it was called, 
um, what was on top of this, they saw the web was kind of a new thing. They actually approached the library and said, is this something we should be on? What should we do with it? And then uh, Gary Schimmick, who's now the director of the library, and Mary Reeder, who was an employee of the library at the time, um, uh, really uh, picked this up. And, and they did a lot of things, um, including uh, putting together a presentation to MSOE leadership on why this is important. What, what, where are we going? Why are the systems? Because folks were really not using this much in business at the time. In business, you would have email within your company. You would have servers where you could share files and spreadsheets and so on. But communicating outside the company walls, that was something fairly complicated that generally took a lot of knowledge that most people didn't have. So that was part of the education about where is this going. Um, Mary Reader really picked up and started the initial version of the MSOE website, a lot of library resources, basic information about the university. And, and Gary was really working on proposals to user policy and kind of looking at, well, where is this going to go? Is it going to be a way that students can make web pages, which was, which was thought of from the beginning? Um, and what would be the policies? Although, as we'll see, it was about two more years before employees and students could make their personal web pages. Um, I saw, did I see a hand going up? Comments, questions? Okay, so- I forgot that was a thing. I remember like, cause this would have been, well, not this early, but in the later nineties, that's when I was like going on the- GeoCities maybe? Yeah, I, I had an Angel Fire page, but I remember yeah. like people who were in college would have like their own like fan, whatever sites, but it would be like University of Michigan, like in the name on the site. And I was like, that's, I forgot that you could do that. <laughs> yes. And, and I mean, this, this was all new and the universities were figuring out, it's like, well, we want to protect our image, but we want our students to be able to exercise their free speech rights. And how are we going to use these resources? So there were a lot of discussions happening in the library and in the administration uh, around that time. Um, so, so, so here I'm kind of getting toward the middle end of my freshman year. And I, I find out, oh, we have a website. This is the new thing. Um, and uh, we, when I, when we, when I started in the fall of '93, we actually put the newspaper, uh, the student newspaper, which was published once per month at the time, onto that Gopher system that I told you about. So it was just the text. I don't think we were doing any images yet on the online version. A few technically inclined people were looking at it. But it was available on the internet. Um, so anywhere in the world, if someone had, it would have been probably a dialing in connection to the internet, you could view the text. Um, you know, back then, the a typical speed on your modem would be 14.4 kilobits, which would have been, um, and these numbers are for 288, which would have been uh, 10,000 times slower, 20,000 times slower actually downloading than your basic cable connection today. So we were very careful about, well, graphics take a long time to download. Do we wanna use them? Do we wanna make them optional? Um, this was one of the er one of the early internet browsers, uh, uh, web browsers, it was called Lynx. It, you can still get it and run it on Unix. Uh, it doesn't display graphics, it'll let you download the graphics. So it kinda looked like that gopher in your face. Um, but starting in mid-94, um, early 94, the people who were really on the cutting edge, they would use these graphical-based browsers on the campus network or even very slowly over dial-up, and they could view the pictures and so on. So that was a big deal. How do we get the pictures in? Well, someone bought a very expensive scanner, which was very low resolution, and you put the negatives of the film in. Um, and the pictures taken for the newspaper came over a serial port into the computer. You used Photoshop and all the software, and it, it, was, it was quite a process to get a picture uh, online back then. Uh, but that's, that's how it was done. Um, the Netscape released uh, at the end of 94. That was a big improvement to the browser. It, it started feeling, it was clunky by today's standards, but it started feeling much more what we think of as a modern web browser. Um, Mo Mosaic, which was used before then, uh, it was exceptionally clunky. Um, 
uh, loading graphics was slow, but it, it worked. It was proving the concept would work. So that's the end of my history lesson. Uh, I, on my next slides, I have some screenshots that I would like to point out what some of these things actually looked like when we used them. Uh, and then I also, at the end, I have a couple of examples of what the code we wrote uh, to, to run this looked like. So, you know, please at any point ask questions. Um, this was the first version, and I got this from the Wayback Machine. Unfortunately, a lot of the files are lost to history. I'm a pack rat, I save a lot, but I couldn't find all of this myself. So we had, as I mentioned, the newspaper uh, was on the Gopher, but then in early 1994, we put the first version on the web. Uh, I don't even know if there were any graphics in that first version, uh, but here you can see it was text and we were excited because we had multiple levels of heading and bolted lists and we could write the code to do that. Um, which actually looked a little better than the, the plain text mode stuff that we had before. There were links. You could open your email program. This was all very exciting. Um, so uh, I have, like I said, I'll share the slides. I have links to this on the Wayback Machine, uh, on the Internet Archive. A lot of the internal links um, were captured. This was actually a 1997 capture, but the file was created in 1994. So, I mentioned, so that's what the, what we did in 94. Um, so I, I mentioned that finally by 1996, um, MSOE decided we can trust our employees and our students to have web pages of their own, and we'll give them access to do that. It won't just be, you know, a couple people in the library and who got special permission to create university content, but there'll be personal content. So um, uh, Mary Reader, who I mentioned before, and I worked on um, workshops to show people well, what do you need to do to create a web page? What tools do you use? Um, what are the Unix commands you need to know um, in order to create the files and set the permissions correctly and all that? So you know, today, if, if, you're, if you're used to doing software, if you're a software or computer science person, and you're used to a Unix platform, you may know these things, but for people who want to do web pages, right, there's a lot more easy to use tools that have evolved. But then this was really the way uh, it had to be done. So these are on the web archive, but boy, look at this classic 1996 design. What, what did we do? Um, and, and you can still do some of these things in HTML, but I, I recommend against it. We had, we had frames. Right, so frames was okay. I have four different documents that I can put on the screen at once. Um, the internet was very slow. We didn't have JavaScript. We didn't have scripting languages to dynamically update different parts of the pages. So the design approach was, well, you may have some navigation widgets that you wanna load once and you don't want that to have to reload every time someone looks at a different page. Today, you would do this with with JavaScript and there would be, and plus your networks are faster, you have a lot more at your disposal. But here's a typical design, there would be some navigation on the left and you, this is a separate HTML document, there'd be some content on the right and you'd have your links within there. So here, this was published in the printed paper, which was probably how 98% of the people read it, but we had the online edition, some alumni were following us um, some students who were into the internet, which was getting a little bigger by 96. People were starting to buy books on Amazon. Now, um, there we did. Um, so this one here, this is actually an image map. This is to make it look fancy like this. This would have been, you wouldn't have tried to do something like this in HTML back in 1996. People, you can't count on the browsers going to have fonts, HTML's ability to specify styles and so on was very limited. Um, so this was an, an image and then there was, we used what was called an image map. I'll show an example of that. You would use a tool to basically say, if someone clicks here, it goes to this. So it's a much more manual process, a much more involved process than what you would do now to, to get a menu system. Um, so yeah, that's that, that, that was what was good design in 96. And maybe we could have done a little better knowing what was come late, coming later, like these color choices are awful, but, but this looked pretty good back then. 
Um, if we go to, and I wish I could have found an earlier version because this is now we're in 1997. So we are on, we're almost, we're like three and a half years after MSOE had a homepage on the World Wide Web. So this was actually after several iterations. Uh, and, and this shows, okay, by 1997, we were trying to get away from frames a little bit. We were getting a little more ambitious saying, okay, we can have some graphics. Um, but, uh, but the design still looks pretty old by today's standards. So a lot of these resources were built out. The links to personal pages were on the home page. Um, you know, the idea, the webmaster email, some places had that, but this was very common. You would have an individual's email um, on, the, on the contact instead of like webmaster or whatever you would uh, mm -hmm. call it today. And uh, here we're doing, you know, background images were also a big thing. You can do them today, but they're kind of out of style. We tend to do simpler, cleaner designs today. So there we go. Uh, questions, comments on the ugly design? Okay. It's, it's, hey, man. Hold on. It's louder than that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, I, uh, so yeah, that was, um, high quality web design, uh, back in early 1997. And, and I, I wish I could dig up some earlier versions. I looked in my own files. You know, I, I couldn't find it. I, I, and web archive, I couldn't find anything earlier than this one. But that's relatively early. Um, oh here, gosh. Here, yeah. Here, this is for a student organization. Here's some good so, 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 so here we are. Oh, I was so proud of this. Seven. Uh, and, and, and you know, I mean, I mean, this ridiculous thing with the fonts, the light green on the back, right? Oh. You know, no, no one would think of doing that today. If you did, it would be right. I mean, yeah, we were, we were, we were trying to make it exciting, but, but this was design. Now, now here, you know, networks were starting to get a bit faster. Um, people had higher speed modems, so even if they um, were accessing this from home and not on the campus network. Um, we weren't quite as worried about how long it would take to download. So, uh, but you know, the background, the watermark, I mean, that was a common design thing. We thought, we thought that looked cool. Look, I can do a watermark. Um, so there, there it is. There were these common graphics everyone reused and, and, you know, does the up arrow or the left arrow mean to go back or go home? Uh, you know, it, it was all very confusing. But it's like we were using semi-standard graphics to to navigate. I, you know, it's it's ugly by today's standards. But uh, some of the resources were there. Um, web guide, yeah. And I guess I had a link to my page. So so there we are. Uh, okay. So that's that's kind of it for my screenshots. But I have a couple things about the technologies we were using, how they were limited, and I'll show you a couple code examples I was able to dig up from the files I saved. Um, so uh, it, the Apache server is still huge today. Um, we, we were running on, uh, I believe it was DEC Unix. So D, uh, Digital Equipment Corporation's ver version of Unix back then. And the web server was running on Apache, I think from the beginning or pretty early. So something that still exists today. Um, that, that image map I showed you with the colored words in the lower left frame, I'm going to show you some code for that in a second. But you also, whenever you did these graphical things, and through, and through maybe at least through 96 or so, you were always thinking about, well, what if the person doesn't have a system that has graphics? What if they're using links to the text browser? My system still has to work with that because a, major, a lot of your users would still be limited to text-based systems. So you, you had to write your code and you tested it on links usually back then, which was text-based. So here um, I have the code and let me do this so you can see it. Here is, and, and, and there, were, there was a GUI program, a graphical user interface, but this is what the code behind the maps looked like for an example we did in one of the workshops. So, and I searched long and hard, I couldn't really find good screenshots of this program. But 
we thought it was so cool. It, you, you would have your image, like with those uh, 10 words or whatever that we showed in the lower left hand of the screen. You would create it using some image editing program, Photoshop, whatever. Uh, and then you would open this image map editor, which you would open the graphic and you would draw boxes over it. If someone clicks here, and then you would fill in, okay, here, here's a rectangle. I don't know if this is corner, corner, or corner X, Y, but it would have, it would save the coordinates and it would say, and you would say, well, where do you want it to go? And you would give it relative URLs, addresses on the website relative to the page you were looking on uh, when someone clicked on that rectangle. And uh, th this file itself was part of what was downloaded to the web browser. So in, in the image tab, nowadays, you say it's an image, you give it a file name or somewhere to find the image resource. Maybe there's other information. You might, your, your, your tools or your code might say how big this is so the browser can lay it out quickly before it downloads it. But you also had a reference to this file, which we get downloaded. And then you had another attribute in the image where you would say, this, this isn't just an image, it's an image map. And if someone clicks on it, refer to this file um, to, to follow up on the click. I, um, I believe Chrome will still honor these. I don't know if anyone uses these uh, in their design nowadays without being ironic, but some of <laughs> you into web design might know, but that was how we did it um, back in uh, March 96. Uh, okay, so, oh, and as long as I have this up, I will show you what, uh, and I, I, I have some more context for this back on the slide. This was um, a ser uh, to search through the issues of the newspaper, the student newspaper. And there might be similar programs to search through library resources or to search through a faculty directory and faculty and staff. We had a, we had a student directory online back then. The uh, rules about privacy were a little bit easier. You could publish the resources and uh, people just did it without thinking about it. We didn't think about privacy. We weren't aware of it the same way we are today. Um, I, I don't know if you guys remember, or you may, you know, th this may have been done by the time you were in college, but when you took a test when I was a freshman um, and, and you wanted to go get your grade because, and the professor said, oh, I'll have them graded by tomorrow morning sometimes. You would go to their office, they would have a list posted on the door, and it would be your social security number and your grade. <laughs> and, and, and it's like, oh, well, no one knows your social security number, so I'm not telling them what your grade is. <laughs> and then the professors who are concerned about privacy, they would just list the last four digits of your social security number. So that, so that, that was the smart way to do it. So the, the idea of pri privacy and how we perceived it was, was very different. And I mean, yeah, there were scams, people got scammed, but it, it wasn't like the internet and all the electronic scamming and the messages, that wasn't around yet. So it, it wasn't, you know, maybe the ramifications weren't quite as bad as they would be today, but it was pretty bad. So you, you would write just like today, you can write backend programs to respond to actions or I think what, what are technically called get and post requests in HTTP, that was all, all existed. But what you wrote tended to be very low level. So the Perl language is still used. I think it's an acronym for something like practical expression and reporting language or something like that. Um, it's really good at regular expressions. And so it was used for manipulating text, transforming text, and, and still is today. So this language has survived. Um, and uh, this is what the code looked like in Perl, setting up some variables and courting the library. My God, I was actually documenting code back then. Um, you would uh, have some things here that I, you know, you could enable these and run it from the command line for testing. So instead of having a web client come in, you would run it locally. Um, and then it was very much a lot of hard coded text and then, uh, you know, there, this isn't very structured, right? It's, it's uh, here, let's start printing out some, some HTML. And this says print until you reach this token. And it's just spitting out HTML and goes through a loop and gives results uh, based on some variables put in. So kind of ugly. Oh, and then, yeah, well, this isn't an image map, but there's an explicit image tag, I guess not very exciting. 
Um, but still, you know, if, if, you, if you do HTML today, this is all pretty much still valid HTML. The style's a little different, um, but the, the language has, has survived. Um, let's see, anything else interesting? Um, so, you know, here, here's the loops uh, where we're basically searching through the database. And then here, let's search through all the articles. And I believe this is going to say, yeah, if it matches what people are asking for. So look how low level this is. It's we're writing loops to actually check, does the text match? Let me go through it. In modern languages, right, you have tools that iterate for you. You have regular expressions or even higher level things that let you search text. Those libraries that do those things, some of them were just starting to be developed then. And now we are almost 30 years later, the technologies are a lot more mature. So when you write this stuff, you don't write stuff like this anymore. You look up, well, what does my application programming interface do for me? And a lot of this would be uh, you know, in the can for you. Some of that was just starting to come out ar around this time. So here we're, you know, we're building how the results look in the table. And there's a lot of conditional stuff. It's like, oh, if the author had an email address, um, let's add the link. And there's code for that. And if they didn't, let's not add the link. And let's here's a hard coding of our scheme for how files are named. It, so it's all very low level um, to, to how you would do it today. Um, yes, so let's see, there it is. Um, yeah, I, I guess uh, there it is. And you know, you, you would say, okay, um, if you put a space in, I'm taking it literally, I'm sorry, I can't write the code to strip spaces off the edge. Uh, you know, people, because it, we were lazy in some ways, you expected a lot more weight to be on the user because you had to write this ugly code to go through it. So that, that, that's it for my code examples. And yeah, um, so we looked at that. Oh, this table's a little glitchy. Um, the interface, and it still exists today. You can still use it on the web servers. Um, it's one of the ways. It's what, but typically, when a request came in, your web browser didn't have most of your web server didn't have most of these capabilities built in. So the typical thing, and you still do this in some cases, is a a, a program would be a, a process would be started to respond to that request, and that was and it still exists called CGI Common Gateway Interface. You saw an example there in Perl. Most of the stuff uh, for web a lot was written in that. You could use C and C++ if you needed to go even more level, low, low, lower level. When you did things like um, manipulating images and so on, there weren't a lot of libraries in Perl, so you might write a C or a C++ program. You know, one thing we did back then, a lot of you know this, if you put in, have an image on a web page, before the image loads, if you tell the browser how big it's going to be in pixels, it does the layout more efficiently so you don't have text jumping around. Well, in order to do that, we wrote a C program that on the server side opened up the image file, got the size, and wrote the HTML tag um, with the size. So today, there's tools that are going to automate a lot of that for you. You're not going to write code to do those sorts of things in 2023. Um, so this was 98. There were some technologies out. If you were on the Microsoft side, Microsoft a couple years ago, before that, that actually back in 96, released ASP Active Server Pages 1.0. The main, they, they wanted to make design web pages easier. So the idea was there were the very primitive tools for connecting a database to a website, searchable databases. Um, a lot more painful to use than what you have now, but somewhat easier to use than that ugly code I just showed you. On the Unix side, PostgreSQL was out in 96, but not a lot of people were using it yet. It was still very common to write this low-level stuff like we just looked at. So better things were coming. PHP was coming soon, uh, but, but what I just showed you was a typical design process, um, you know, even through early 98. Um, that's what I had prepared. Um, I'm glad to answer questions or reminisce about old times. This is fun stuff. Um, I, I, th I think I was very lucky that I got into this because um, it, 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 when you got to like 95, 96, 97, local companies, they wanted to get websites up. 
in 1997, I was getting paid $50 an hour by local companies, which was a lot more then even than it is now, because it was so rare to find someone who could connect a website to a database. Um, so yeah, web, web design is still hot, it's important, it's well compensated, but then it was an even rarer skill to find. So I felt very lucky I got into this early and exposed to it as a student and uh, MSOE didn't pay me that much, that was fine. They, they treated me uh, very well. But yeah, outside you could command a lot more. Sure, <laughs> or not necessary. <laughs> um, yeah, are, are there, do you think anyone wanna take another look at anything I show or questions or are we good? I, I had a brief thought when you mentioned about the code uh, where you would have to consider um, if they were loading images, if they could load images. Right. And I just had a brief connection of how that is a sort of similar equivalent to today where the person designing or the, the team designing a website has to think about how it will look on a phone yes. or on a tablet because so many people, I feel like, the trend now is that a lot of people don't even own laptops. Yeah. Like my mother has an iPad with a keyboard attached. Yeah, I have some right. of, like an actual right. like so, so, or MacBook or something. So yeah, the small screens are are in again, but in a very different way. And and so what would happen with those image maps is if you were on a text-based browser. Um, it would actually give you the names of the links. I think there, there was a way to say what the text would be for it, and you would use your arrow keys and, and you would move around, but you wouldn't see the image. Um, so even using an image map though, you're like, well, this isn't gonna be quite as easy for someone on text, they'll be able to use it. So yeah, I, I would say, you know, between somewhere between 96-ish, we start stopped worrying quite as much about text base. But still, if you're on a Unix machine, you probably have links installed or you can install it easily. It's still being developed. Go, I, I haven't tried it lately, but go to MSOE's website. I, it might not work very well, uh, but, or, or maybe it will. I kind of doubt it. Yeah, the color schemes were awful. We mixed red and green. Uh, you know, it's like in theory, we knew that some people were colorblind, but, it, but we were much, it, it was just much less in the culture to be careful of those things. It, so, I mean, things are better now. We know, we, I think it's in our practice to be more considerate of good design issues and accessibility compared to what it was then. You also, you, you might have had like a limited color palette too, where you could only have like hot pink and lime green. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah, I mean, de depending, the monitors weren't as you know good. The 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 they you, they were low resolution displays, so you would do stuff like that. I mean, you saw those photos on the MSOE webpage. They were photoshopped to be very high key, and you you wouldn't you wouldn't do that today. You would you would you know make it more subtle, most likely. So yeah, you worked with the limitations of the hardware you had and, and the conventions of the day. You keep saying too you were navigating with arrow keys. Was that more common than using a mouse? Um, well, in the text mode, you a lot of times it didn't support the mouse. Um, some of them did. It was kind of like a local overlay where it would say, oh, uh, if it would support the mouse and then, but it's basically going to be your local program, figuring out how to use the arrow keys to get you there. So um, it depends. I mean, if you were using Mosaic and there was a Windows version in late 93 um, on Windows and you had downloaded that and you were savvy enough, that then yeah, you could use a mouse. Um, but yeah, the text mode ones generally aren't gonna, weren't, weren't gonna support a mouse. Business. Yeah, it's it's fun to be in on the technology as it develops. So I I, you know, I hope and I imagine a lot of you like that in your field, whatever it is, you're geeking out on the latest thing. But this is the stuff we were geeking out on about not quite 30 years ago. <laughs> I guess I have a question. Sure. So when did like user experience like experience of UX stuff become a real job? Um, like at what point did they kind of realize that maybe we shouldn't have like 
Maybe we should have somebody to tell us to like, you know, not to have spinning uh, GIF background. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, I guess you could see some of it there. It's the, you know, by the 97, 98 stuff was looking better than some of the early stuff. I, and I'm not an expert on this. I, I think really in the early 2000s, things were getting a lot better. Um, but even through, I don't know, 2000, I'm, I'm guessing it's from memory, it's rusty, 2005, 2006, it was still very common for websites to be a list of 87 links. And, and, and see, so Google, yeah, I'm trying to remember, was it like 2002-ish, three-ish, where Google came out? And, I think 2003. Yeah, and, and so, so that, and that's like six years, after, five, six years after the latest stuff I showed you. So then that changed things, right, because you could find easier. So that changed design, because a lot of this early design, it's like, let's list all the links for people. Um, Yahoo used to be lists of hundreds of links, and they tried to have this taxonomy so you could find stuff because search was slow. There was Alta Vista, there was Excite, which were some of the better pre Google search engines, but they were much more limited in what they could do. They were slow, they would miss things, they would be out of date. So, so the innovations that Google made with their algorithm and released early, very early 2000s that free people up to say, oh, well, they can Google it, they can search for it. I don't have to give them a complete index of 80 things that I'm updating every week. I remember, I mean, this one is maybe a bad example of uh, typical or cutting edge technology, but when MySpace was a thing, you could put so much crap on your MySpace page, and then you go to someone's page and it was like your computer would be struggling to open it. Oh, yeah. Because they'd have like a web file or something, and then they'd have like, like a spinning skull in the background and then a, like, yeah, glittery it, fonts. And yeah. it wouldn't it, just be like, it, you could be like the site's like half loaded. Yeah. I mean, it was all, it was all shiny and new. It's like, Oh, I can put sound on my website now. And I just discovered how I do this and everyone was doing it. And yeah, sp spinning gifs that you download. I'm sorry. I say it with a soft G. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you know that that was that 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 was a big thing. It was very in your face and gaudy and new. And then you know it, it got tempered. And I think really early to mid aughts, uh, if I can use that word, uh, the design started to mature. It still continues to to get to get more mature and to say, oh well, we have high resolution. We can do more photos, um, a lot more interactivity. Uh, the, the technologies were very new then. They weren't well supported in the browsers for, for you know, um, uh, really using CSS well and um, really use uh, dynamic HTML you didn't have back then. So the technologies have really enabled a lot. Well, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I, it was re really good uh, reminiscing with you. Um, I, I guess I'll email you the presentation if you want to share it. I want you to I did just say I'll 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 say